Chris, thanks again for joining us today. My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, let's start with what is new from this report. What's different than what we've heard from other reports and analyses that are out there? What my colleagues and I reported today was that uh, some efforts that we did in June were that we uh, um, identified a plume of oil that, of, that existed about 3,500 feet below the surface. And we um, tr tracked it. We almost, you know, hunter gathered it we, for uh, about, uh, uh, you know, about 20 miles. And, and we showed that it was like a continuous moving river of material that contained um, petroleum hydrocarbons or compounds from oil. Um, and that was the first time that anybody had done that. Some had thought that these plumes were more like, you know, like your grandmother's perfume bottle that kind of went pss and hit, you know, there was like these little clouds. Mm -hmm. But actually it was a moving, coherent, continuous plume that we went for 22 miles. We did find some oil compounds in there. We're working on analyzing for more of them. The key thing, though, when people th thought of plumes and you speak to them to the lay public, is they think it's this big squirting bottle of Hershey syrup flying mm -hmm. down the middle of the ocean. And in reality, the water is clear, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not toxic. Well, it's that's like, an interesting point, Chris, yeah. because not only are we talking about 3,000 feet below the surface of the Gulf, you can't see this with your naked eye in terms of bringing up a sample and just looking at the Gulf no, water itself. No, and I sampled it. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about the breakdown and the chemical reactions that Not are happening? Not really, because, you know, you, uh, the technology to measure oil and the levels of oil that, uh, that cause potential harm are l so low that just the fact that your nose doesn't smell it uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's not harmful. 22 miles long, how come no one found this before you did? Certainly well, everyone was looking. I think other right? colleagues may have uh, seen samples around there. So, you know what, we were lucky, but let's think about it. My other colleagues, and, and I'm not knocking them, they, they used a device to collect samples, and they basically poked at the water. They lowered it, and they brought the samples back up, or, or they kind of used a sensor, and they said, oh, okay, we, we see something. You at know? regular intervals, they're yeah, doing they this. Yeah, they kind of right. see something. All right, well, if we connect the dots, you know, maybe this is a plume. And that was their definition of a plume. That's how they define it. I'm not saying that's wrong or right. What we did was we went down to that depth. We massaged it. We went all over it. We know. We hit it. And so that's a much different, maybe even more robust definition than maybe connecting the dots. But, you know, it's, it's what you want. And in this case, we wanted to get a really good idea as the size and the shape of this plume because... One of the big questions from a basic science experiment is, doesn't oil float? Why? What is this going at? If you asked me the day after the spill, I've been studying oil spills for 15 years, would I have ever thought that there was going to be a plume like this? I would have said no. But you also said uh, in, in discussing a report earlier today, Chris, that never before have we had this volume to study 5,000 feet no. below the surface no, of the water. I mean, the term unprecedented has been overused, mm -hmm. but it's quite accurate. I mean, it's, you know, I wish there was a better word, and I actually went on the thesaurus, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it is unprecedented on so many levels. I mean, um, you can't, I could list them forever, you know. Uh, I want to get back to the way that you collected these samples and, and arranged this data. You used a submersible. Yes. Which seemed to be crucial yes. throughout this process, being yes. down at that level. Yes. So uh, one of the interesting things was that my colleagues and I were studying um, natural oil seeps off the coast of California. And so, you know, the La Brea tar pits, mm -hmm. you know, that's natural oil seeping up on land. Uh, the Beverly Hillbillies when Jed hits oil, those are all <laughs> natural oil seeps. They occur, occur off the coast of California and even in the Gulf of Mexico. So we did something very similar in September. We were hunting and looking for some oil compounds off the coast of California. So we were a really crack team in terms of we knew what we had to do when we came out here. Um, this vehicle is called Sentry, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. You can lower it over the side. It's got no cable, and, uh, and you can tell it what to do at the beginning, and you throw it over the side and say, we said go to 1,100 meters or about 3,300, 3,500 feet, mm -hmm. and Go look. And what happened for us, which was really interesting for us for Century, was we 
programmed sentry. We lowered it down, right? And then we said, start looking. And, and we could see real time. It would be sending up data. And it would say, oh, I see oil, I see oil, I see oil, I see oil, I see oil. Nope, don't see it anymore. And at that and, point, you can turn it around? Yeah, we could turn it around. Because originally, when we started it, we didn't know how wide it was, so we made what we call the legs really long. But then we can program and say, stop, turn back, and you know that's pretty, that's pretty gee whiz. Uh, one of the things that you found was the relative success that microbes are or are not having degrading the soil, digesting it, processing it. Yeah. What does that tell you about the natural process that's underway in the Gulf right now? You know, it's really hard to generalize what's going on in the Gulf. Um, like I said, oil, you know, this is, you got a 14-year-old boy. You want some money, right? Microbes are teenagers. You say, look, I want you to clean the garage. I want you to do it on Friday. He doesn't do it on Friday. He does it on Sunday because that's more convenient for him at that time. And what does he do? He only does half the job. He only does the things that are the really easy part. He doesn't do the hard compounds. He doesn't do it at the right time. That's what microbes are. They work on their own time. They work on their own, and they choose what's easiest to do. So there's a, there's, microbes will eat oil, and mm -hmm. they are probably in the Gulf, and you will see it. But, you know, they, oil has got like a buffet of different molecules, and um, so they're going to hit the baked stuffed shrimp and the prime rib. <laughs> but at some point, you know, they hit the celery and the peanut butter, and it's, it's game over. Mm -hmm. so, so microbes do work. Um, I haven't seen much of the data to... Um, that describes the extent of microbial degradation. I don't doubt it. We just didn't happen to see it in our location. And that's kind of the, the wonder of nature. You know, you look at the size of the Gulf of Mexico, it's pretty big. You know, we can't assume, like, if we put that footprint on the U.S. land and say, is the weather over here in the bottom left-hand corner the same as the top right-hand corner? It's really, and then, then you have to add in 5,000 feet, so you had a third dimension. So uh, it's tricky. Uh, given your experience dealing with oil seeps uh, off the coast yeah. of California, you had to come in with some sort of expectations about what you may or may not find. Do you come away encouraged by what you found and the longer term picture for this degradation? Or were you expecting something much smaller and were surprised by the massive size of this plume? I came in completely open. I, hmm. I, I, I remember sitting you know, the data would come up and you could see in these two flat screen TVs and just going, I can't believe this. I just can't believe this. I, I mean, and you know, sitting there doing calculations and just saying, whoa, I, mean, I just can't believe it. And, you know, I, I, I got to be honest with you, I don't want to sound too excited because 11 people died and the livelihoods of countless people and, and things like that. Um, so I'm not excited about this spill. I try to be excited about science because I think it's important for the lay public to understand that science is good and that we, you know, that, and also to sometimes get past the stereotype that we, we're not last pick in gym class, too. <laughs> so you can be excited about science and not be goofy, or at least I hope I'm not today. So. Chris, final question for yeah. you. If you didn't have expectations going in, then given your experiences, what are your expectations for the Gulf's recovery? Okay, so. Um, Recovery, in many people's minds, is thought as something like uh, an on-off switch, like you break your leg, and then six weeks later, you do a little physical therapy, everything is fine. Um, recovery in an ecosystem that's been hit so hard, like the Gulf of Mexico, is like a bad car accident. And just like somebody's in the hospital in critical care, there are scratches that are going to heal quickly, the broken leg may heal quickly, um, you might be in a coma for a long time, um, the key thing is that there's a wide spectrum of time that it takes for recovery. And, um, and then, then we have to start to discover, determine uh, what level of recovery is okay. Let's make believe that the car accident had just occurred and it was a loved one and the doctor says, I don't think it's, I don't think, you know, there's a good chance your loved one's not going to make it. And the person pulls through and has a limp. Is that recovery? would be to me, right? I mean, you know, you know, what is acceptable for a recovery after this unbelievable uninvited guests coming mm -hmm. along and kicking butt in the Gulf? And this is something that we'll have to see with time. And just like that, that 
that person who was in the car accident. We have to monitor vital signs. We have to monitor um, checkups. And that's what we're going to have to do with follow-up science in the next uh, couple months. And I think in about six months or 12 months, I think we'll start to get a good idea as to, you know, what might have got hit harder. You know, it's just, it's just hard, you know. There's a lot of data out there. Uh, it's good. Data's good, but we need to work it out. Dr. Chris Reddy, taking time on a very busy week to join That's us. That's my Thank, pleasure. Thanks again for your time. Yep, sure. All right.